How's it going YouTube? So this video is kicking off another playlist or you know um, library of videos specifically interviewing people that have either 3D printed model roller coasters or 3D printed amusement park rides and we're gonna kick it off with you know talk about my own experience with Invertigo and then dive into some of the other projects that others have worked on and there's a group and a community of 3D printer amusement park people. Um, it's called Coaster Printing Central and they asked me, they, they reached out to me to kind of just host and interview um, these other individuals that have done and 3D printed model rides. So I thought, you know, it'd be great. It's a great experience. I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not the moderator. I, I'm just a member. I just kind of float around there. So um, I thought it would be a great opportunity to at least, you know, support other people in the community. And what better way to kick it off with my own story. So enjoy the series. Um, in the description below, you'll see links to the Instagram page. Just shoot them a DM there. Be like, hey, I saw this video. I want to join. What do I got to do? They'll hook you up. I actually, I, I, shooting this video, I have no idea. They just said, direct you guys there. And we'll go from there. So with that, um, here we go. How is it going, YouTube? I got a treat for you today. We're going to do a full length behind the scenes look at Invertigo. Invertigo was made in 2016 as the first 3D printed roller coaster that functioned that I was able to get my hands on and struggle my way through and I wanted to share that entire experience. There is snippets online of the roller coaster in action, um, but nothing that documented how I designed it, how I fabricated it, and how I put it all together to make it what it is. And there is now communities around that are centered on 3D printing model roller coasters. And I've come to learn that, you know, everyone seems to know about Invertigo and we need to talk about everything about it. And that's what this video is. So thank you for joining. Um, I hope to answer every question that people have asked throughout the years um, about the model and will do so. Um, with that, I just want to give a little background on what the model was about. I wanted, I, I actually had no idea that it would spiral into what I do now. Um, I just had a 3D printer and the CAD knowledge and I was like, you know, I can take no limits data and, and 3D print this. And I did. And I started by just making a loop. I 3D printed a loop that I designed and it looked really good. And I was like, I should make like a model and see what happens. And I was like, wait a second. I was following some really cool people at the time. Uh, Chris Brewer, um, Phil Kaiser, Mike Graham. They had working model roller coasters. And I was like, whoa, wait, what if I 3D print it? I'm not really good at modeling stuff, you know, with, you know, hot glue guns and balsa wood and PVC pipes and whatnot. Uh, but if I could 3D print it, that'd be awesome. So that's what I did. I picked a small layout in Vertigo at King's Island because it was a ride I've been on. It's small, it could fit on a sheet of plywood and it could fit in my garage and I could transport it around. And it wasn't like I had a 3D print tons of track. I could, you know, put it all together relatively quick. So the model had 33 track sections. I started by designing the track and then from there designed the supports and then designed the station and then lastly designed the train. I, I like doing layouts in No Limits and I did a inverted boomerang coaster in No Limits and extracted that data and went to town. And what I mean by that is I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have 
print my ride to go and look up tutorials on how to get the data. I just stumbled through it. I started and actually, I'll let you know, went on a little secret. Don't follow anything I tell you in this video. Everything I did was just me learning on, you know, what does and doesn't work. So I would just caution you, if you see me do something in this video, uh, take it with a grain of salt. It's probably not the way you should do this design work effectively. So warning, don't do any of this. But with the track, I just modeled it all as one piece. I was like, I'll split it up later because I didn't know any better. Um, modeled the entire track and then went back and said, oh, I need to fit this in a 3D printer. So we're gonna have to split it up. I then went and make, made planes um, in the sections of where it needed to be. And I was like, cool, we can print track. Now we gotta do supports. And I had no idea at the time how to even design supports, let alone how, how would I 3D print them? And I realized, well, if I have these tall tubes, I should just use dowel rod. Why would I 3D print a cylinder? It didn't make sense. Like 3D printing is a tool in your toolbox. You use a hammer for nails, screwdriver for screws, 3D printing for complex geometry. So if you have a cylinder, we're gonna use a dowel. You could use PVC pipe. Um, just, you know, use every tool what it's for. With that, I, started designing supports, used the dowel rods, made the connecting points, tried to make everything as easy as possible. And then once I had the supports, I had footers. Footer locations was really difficult. I was like, okay, uh, footers, am I gonna 3D print these little blocks? I decided to laser cut plywood footers. And then from those, I could locate them on the plywood and I used a laser cutter to plot on the plywood where those locations were. So that is how I was able to get the locations. And then lastly, I had to design the train. And the train design we will save for another segment um, a little bit later of this video because that uh, spirals into a whole nother level of complexity. When the design of the, I'll call this version one, we are at version one of Invertigo. This version had 3D printed rails. It also had, um, you know, parts that were printed off of remnant filament that I had. So it was all sorts of colors. And I was like, ah, eh, screw it, we'll paint it later. I really had nothing in mind. I was just kind of putting together, um, you know, it, it was all prototype. I had no idea what it was gonna turn into. And so we had dowel rods connecting these um, plates that would then connect to the supports, which would connect to laser cut footers, uh, which then connected to the 3D printed track that had the rails 3D printed on them. And it was very exciting to see everything come together. But one of the things that I would come to find out is that 3D printing the rails was a mistake. It's just supporting it on the 3D printer I had to, you know, juggle, you know, where if I would do supports like directly on the bed, supports everywhere, um, what type of geometry for the supports. It was a total disaster. I was like, do I put the rails down? Do I put them in the air? And I kind of, at least for that, I landed on just put the rails straight up and then we'll just deal with taking the supports off. And there was times where I wasn't careful and just broke the rails right off or the print would fail. Um, this was very common because I had no idea what I was doing. It was very frustrating, but it, w what eventually happened is I would just, you know, actually start placing supports and, and readjusting how I would place it on the table just to make sure I'd get something that was working. And then also something that when the rails were printed out, I didn't have to sand it for hours. So that was just another, you know, hurdle we had to overcome. That was just a total pain. So the footers were really cool. Now that we have lasered where they go, I basically popped holes through the grass and then put the footer right through, kind of like the real assembly. Like, so you have your 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 foundation bolt sticking out of the ground, and you could slide that footer right on top of it, and then bolt the, I guess in a real world it'd be steel, but in my case it was the 3D printer footed, 3D printed footer, and then that would sandwich all together and then you would wrench it all down. So it kind of went together like 
a real roller coaster as far as the foundation of it, which I thought was kind of slick. The train, oh my gosh. The train was just the most complicated, complex model I've ever designed and 3D printed for a multitude of reasons. The final train had running wheels, upstop wheels, side wheels, just one one wheel per um, on, each, on each rail. And then the, the joint that would connect each car was essentially a giant skateboard bearing because I had a ton of them around. And it had a 3D printed axle that would go to a Lego universal joint. And then that would then connect to the next car with a zip tie. So it was very scrappy, the final version, but it worked just fine. Now, nowadays, I have a whole different setup now that I know mostly how roller coasters go together correctly. Originally, the train just had a spacer that rotated on a pin. Like a Pinewood Derby wheel, essentially. You have a nail with a little plastic wheel. And I was like, would that work? Uh, well, I didn't even put it on the track. I, I spun it, I was like, yeah, this ain't, this ain't working at all. And at the time, I was looking around at what others, well, other roller coaster modelers did, and you know, ball bearings was the next solution. And I got some off eBay, and they were terrible. They were just, you know, just globs of grease everywhere. They didn't spin. So I was, I spent an entire weekend just degreasing the crap out of them. I had to like clean them all with a toothbrush, just re-degreasing them, oiling, trying out different methods. I could write a thesis on how to clean uh, ball bearings um, until they were, just, you know, just ran like butter. And, and the solution was just, you need to have dry bearings. Just dry bearings, no grease, no oil, nothing. Just just let it run dry. And they worked really well. So in the interest of science, I'm gonna show you how shitty this is. This is the first time I even have a train on here. And that's it, that's all it moves. It, it gets caught everywhere. Um, every transition gets caught. Uh, yeah, this is, that's about it. <laughs> it's, it's sad. So yeah, this is where we're at right now. I guess the only purpose of even putting a video on is just showing you how bad the first, the first trial is. So you can only go up from here. It's sad. The layer separation caused so much vibration in the train as it ran across it that I was like, okay, well, this is a bummer, but what if I sand them down? So I actually tried to sand down the rails and that didn't work. And I also realized I had another problem is I was putting these track pieces together. The rails weren't actually lined up perfectly just due to uh, warping from the prints or, you know, actually I had no idea why some of these didn't line up. Uh, but I had to take a heat gun and basically just torch the rail and then bend it to meet up perfectly, um, which was really uh, hacky. But it worked. So there, there was a lot of things that went wrong with that. Um, track didn't meet up. Train vibrated like crazy. And then also train issues. So in the middle of while all this was happening, there was events that took place that I took the model to um, while I was learning, while I was struggling through all this. The first event was Maker Fair in Detroit. And at that time, I had put together all of the, the track and the supports. I just started dabbling with putting the train together, but it didn't work at all. This is at the point where I realized, uh, I'm in over my head, I don't know what's gonna happen. It didn't work, and actually I, I wasn't gonna take the model to Maker Fair. 
and I think this was Maker Faire 2017, I believe, in Detroit. And I wasn't gonna bring it, but I was part of a makerspace called i3 Detroit, and some of my friends there were like, oh dude, who cares if it doesn't work? Just bring it. People will give you pointers, comment on it, you know, showcase it. You got you gotta bring it. I, I didn't want to. I, I kind of was choking up to the fact that I was like, this is a failure. I don't even want to keep working on it. I don't know what's going on. But they talked they twisted my arm. They they were saying they didn't have enough, you know, stuff to put in this giant tent. Um, who knows if that was ever true. It looked kind of full when I was there. But I took it and it was it was great. There was a lot of positive feedback and actually most of the people that came up, they're like, oh, will it work? And I was like, well, the idea was, but it doesn't really work right now. I'm like, oh, dude, just stick with it. You'll get it working. Uh, I'll come back next year and see if it's working. Um, and just, you know, there's just support where I actually really didn't think there was going to be. As I said, like I thought it was a failure. At this point, I'm already, you know, pulling my hair out because it's not working at all. And I, I think it was a good experience because when I came back from Maker Fair, that was the point where I'm like, okay, we're gonna go back to square one on these rails. Well, the 3D printed rails didn't work, didn't make it around. So what's next? Let's not 3D print the rails. So tragically, we had to start from square one, go back to the design, delete every rail. Well, I designed it with rails. so. I re-swept that circle, the uh, following those rails and basically bully and subtracted out the rails, re-sliced everything up, re-printed everything, repainted everything, and then we put it back together. And this is Invertigo version two. And in version two, we use butyrate tubing as the track. And this worked considerably better. There was no vibration in the rails, and I was ecstatic. Okay, so what we gotta do here is we're gonna take off all the track and then put the new track without rails on and then glue on the new rails to the uh, 3D printed track spine. So it's gonna take hopefully an hour to take all this off and retrack everything. So it'd be kinda cool to see just the supports just hanging in there, so. So when I had to go back and retrack the structure with butyrate tubing, I, I was gluing it and holding it. I had clamps to hold it. The clamps sucked, it, it was a pain. So I made J-clips is what I called them. And what I would do is I would glue uh, dabs of glue on the cross tie, hold up the tube and then insert the J-clip which would just snap right into place and hold the tube to the cross tie. And then I'd move on to the next cross tie, just dab, place, snap. This was gonna work. This was the solution. No. I spent hours in a garage watching my dream just, you know, blow up in front of me and wonder what the hell I was doing out there. Um, a more younger, sadder me was just trying everything. Like, what the heck? I have wheels that spin reliably. I have a track as smooth as butter. And I still don't get this car that goes around. And what the freaking heck, man? It worked in no limits. All I did was scale it down. The only thing that's not scaled is gravity. I was getting really upset. And this is also where I learned you can't just assume in a simulator um, that it's going to work, you know, when you scale it down. So I, I really had to go back down to the fundamentals. What is, what is different? And if I'm scaling everything, I didn't account for weight. So weight was an issue. And I was like, okay, um, well, if, if the weight is an issue, we're going to, we're going to load this thing up. So I, I really had to go and look around like how much does a roller coaster car weigh? How much does a roller coaster car weigh with people? How does much, how much does a train weigh with people? And then you basically have to do your momentum equation, figure out, okay, well, I need to have that momentum throughout the ride. I need to make sure my train has the right momentum. 
I just realized that my train needs to weigh a ton. So we got these trains. I realize we need weight. Um, now I'm just mad searching the internet. Like, okay, how do I, you know, make these things weigh a ton? And the first thing I actually was thinking about, I went back to all the things that went wrong and I was like, oh yeah, I was thinking about Pinewood Derby cars. I actually went and typed in Pinewood Derby car weights, bought weights and just started gluing them everywhere. I was just like, just, just load it up, load it up, just glue it. I ran out of weights and I was like, I still need weight. Got some quarters, got some pennies, nickels, dimes weren't really that heavy but I, I loaded it up with money weights it was a money train i swear to you and i lifted that thing up just with my hand um and this thing weighed so much and i was like i, I was actually like i don't i was so over this project i was like i don't even care if this train just flies off and shatters everywhere it was so heavy i lifted it up to the top i let it go and it flew right through the whole circuit it made the entire thing and i was just like oh my god this is amazing. And at that moment, all my motivation just came right back. And I'm like, this thing's going to work. I'm, I have it, so it completes the circuit. It completes it perfectly. Um, the only issue now is I need to find a place to put the weight and make it look good, make it look like a real um, Vacoma train. And then after that, it's all mechanical. Then we just got to make the little lift hill work, and yeah, we're done. It'll be easy peasy. So that was just... That was the moment where I, I knew I was onto something. I was like, we, we just put a ton of weight on this thing and it just flew. What a great moment. That was just like such like a relief off my shoulders, but oh we we weren't even we weren't even through the through the woods yet. So Maker Fair was the first public appearance of Invertigo. The second was at TPED at Purdue, which is theme park engineering and design at Purdue. And I was asked to bring the model there by uh, Jared Pike, who approached me after seeing some videos and some pictures that were floating around the internet of just the design of, of, of Invertigo and SolidWorks. And they said, hey, we got this you know, crew of individuals that want to see your model. Um, I went to Purdue. I got my um, bachelor's and master's degree from Purdue. Love Purdue. And <laughs> I'm still in contact with these guys. And they asked me to come and, you know, show the model off and kind of, um, you know, talk about what I've been doing with the model and so forth. Well, I said, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to take the model. So I had this, you know, just burning desire to make sure this is going to be awesome. I was like, we're going to show these kids. It's going to be cool. Um, I feel for them. I got the same passion. We're going to get this thing going. I worked every day, like day and night. I was working in the morning all the way to the afternoon, got home from work and I'd burn the midnight oil on this thing and it was it was just like everything just was against me i couldn't uh, and all these videos you'll see just me struggling in the dead of night just you know open up the garage door just see if i can get this thing working and trying out different things, different weights, different bearings, different everything. And I was just finding ways left and right to just make this thing not work. And the last thing I wanted to do is take a model uh, to, to these kids and just be like, yeah, it doesn't really work at all. So it, it, it really sucked. The day before we have to drive the model to Purdue, um, I got a transit van where we're gonna load this thing into because it's a four, it's on a four foot by eight foot sheet of plywood. I got little legs. I redesigned the whole thing to be on a nice table. I scrapped all the grass, put new grass down, put new footers, seriously rebuilt the thing, version three of Invertigo. And I'm ready for, you know, to take this thing to Purdue. And, and it's like three in the morning, on Saturday, because I think it was a Saturday. It was here three in the morning on a Saturday, Sunday. Don't even remember. <laughs> I'm not even gonna go look it up. Who cares? But I, I'm just busting butt. I was like, dude, 
I got three hours before we got to load this thing up and it's just not freaking working. And I remember sitting there like in the middle of the night, I was like, dude, it, like, I don't want to work on this anymore. It's, it's not going to happen. And I was like, you know what? We'll just keep, we'll just get it as far as I can get it and just, you know, screw it. We'll just do what we can. So I took the model to Purdue. There's a video um, with the link here that you can check out and you will see a, you know, highly caffeinated, sleep deprived me uh, trying to be very, well, I am very excited, but trying to be energetic in an interview. And I loved, I loved it. It was the best thing. It was such a uh, rejuvenation of positive energy just to go there because um, when I was there, I was like, hey, here's a cool model. Let's talk about it. And I showed everyone around what I was doing um, as, as I was developing this project just for fun. And I was worried that, you know, everyone would be crapping on it. Like this thing doesn't work yet. And I apologize. Like I wanted it to work, but these are my issues. And it was great. Cause when they shot the video, uh, Jared was so great. Cause he was just like, you know what? I don't care if it doesn't work right now. I know you're going to make it work. So he shot it in a way to make it look like it worked at the time, even though, uh, I had some issues with the Arduinos still dealing with the issues with the weight of the train. It can make the circuit. It was just the lift hill. Like it was at that point in time, I was dealing with the, the weight aspect of the train and he filmed it in such a way that it looked like it worked. Um, with the, uh, you know, comment when I was leaving, you know, it, it's gotta work eventually, you know, you know you're gonna make it work great. So um, that was that was great because I, I was really upset that it, it didn't work at the time. And I would later go on to talk to other in industry professionals that make models. Um, and this is gonna tie into my Chris Gray story where I was talking to him about it and he said, hey, cool model, really like it. I want a full shot. I want a non-edited cut from start to finish of this model working. And I was like, I don't have one of those yet. So now whenever I have a model that works from start to the end, I call it the Chris Gray shot and we eventually got there. So the lift hill, or lift hills, there's two lift hills. Each was uh, driven by a DC motor and it had limit switches at the top. So once it got to the top, I would know the train is at the top and that would signal the lift to stop, trigger the other lift hill and so on and so forth. Well, <laughs> the first issue I had was I got this stupid heavy train. How do I lift it to the top? And at first I, I was like thinking, I'm like, oh, I can just put a magnet on there. Uh, no, no, even a neodymium earth magnet couldn't hold this freaking like 10 pound train or I don't even know how, it was, it was stupid heavy. So I, I had to readjust the weight of the train and I actually started taking weights off until it didn't complete the circuit. Put some, a little more weights on for, you know, the safety factor to make sure it was heavy enough. And I found like, you know, a, a decent weight that it would make it around uh, without issue and it wasn't as heavy as it originally was when I was just throwing weight on it. But I still had this problem of like, I can't hold this thing. It, it, there's not enough magnetic power to hold it as it drives it up. So I had magnets on the front, I had magnets on the following cars, and it would, it would barely hold the thing. And you could shake the table as it was going up and probably disengage it from the magnets. It was, it was like walking on thin ice to get this thing to stick. But eventually we, we were able to figure it out and it is held by a magnet on the front of the train, on the back on the second lift hill. And then on the first car, there's a plate and we put the magnets on the train there because I had to package everything and I wasn't gonna go and re 3D print another lift hill to make this, this, this contraption work. So that, that's how the lift, uh, the lift hill works. The station is cool. Each, each car is um, engaged by its own plunger from its own servo motor, which at the time of designing it, I wanted it all to kind of be like a four bar linkage and just run off two motors. And it, it started looking really wonky and I was like, you know what, screw it. We'll just give every, every seat its own servo. So, it was pretty much that simple. We put a servo with a plunger, that plunger would push down, and then the plunger would then hit a rubber band spring-loaded um, 
plunger inside the car and that would just lift and lower the restraints. So that was actually very easy. The issue lied at making sure that the plunger actually lined up right above the car. And to do that, we had to actually um, home the, the train. So as it got connected back up to the first lift hill, you'll in some of the videos you'll see the lift hill keep moving up because no matter where it catches the train, I need to position it back perfectly after the ride is over. So that's why once the train kind of just it kind of slams into where the magnets are, it's a it's a model. It doesn't have to actually work like the real thing. Um, once it slams in, it knows to only go X distance before stopping to line the train up perfectly. That's how I was able to make sure the train gets back to the right spot to then re-engage the plungers and have the seats work. So it's not really some mystery as to how we position the train. It's all just based off the knowledge of how long the train is, how long we have to have the motors running, and we can go from there. When programming in Vertigo, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I use an Arduino and I Googled everything. I try to be pretty organized for the slight bit that I tried to. Um, I, I wanted to have a control panel that ran everything. And I realized like the more functions I put into this model, the crazier the wiring got, the more complicated keeping things organized was. I, I had to put together um, just all sorts of documentation on you know what pins go to what buttons, what callouts in my code, what you know motors are driven by which pins and uh, uh, the servos was a disaster because every car had its own servo and and I learned really quick that I'm not an electrical engineer and I am not a programmer but I tried my best and it, it came out and works great if you read my code you'd probably scream and shriek because it's really not um, optimized at all but there was a lot to be learned from the programming and wiring of Invertigo. Um, one of the things I learned is since I had, no joke, seven servos on the station ready to go, um, when when I activated the plungers for the first time, nothing worked. I was like, I was like the code's right. Um, I've tried these individually, but when I tried to trigger like seven at once, nothing. Like it was just like, like the motors were just frazzled. Um, I, I learned how to incorporate different electrical components like diodes, capacitors, resistors, all of those things to get this thing to work. And I could even make a whole video on just the wiring and software, the code that was written to drive this thing. But since I'm not really proficient in that, I'll save that for another time and just let you know that it was crazy. The, the the board on this thing or the control panel was really cool because I wanted it to be just like a real coaster. And if you check out my interview with Coaster 101, I dive into all the functionality of that panel. So the third, and in my mind, the most special debut of Invertigo, uh, was with an interview with Nick at Coaster101.com. And with that interview, it wasn't, I guess, public in the sense that people were there. But he had asked me if, if the model was working, and at that point it was, after struggling for eons with this thing. And he said, hey, can you just you know do an interview walking around the model, your workshop, and you know talk about it. And you can go to Coaster 101 to watch the full interview and watch what I call, you know, the full start to finish uncut Chris Gray shot of the model working. There's a couple shots of it, you know, in this video. But it was great. And it was well received. Everyone loved it. At that time, I had not seen another 3D printed coaster um, on the internet. There might have been one out there, but not one that was functioning and working like a real one. So it was very cool to see, and the the outcry of enthusiasm was like so immense that I was like, "Holy crap, this is amazing! Uh, what a journey um, just to get here, and what's what's next?" And I think that is a great place to, you know, at least close this chapter of print my ride Detroit because it was at that point that I had a fully functional model that worked that functioned like a real one. 
really snowballed or started the snowballing of, of where where I'm at today and how I was able to get any recognition in an industry that I thought I would never even dabble in. So I couldn't just stress how you know fortunate I was to you know meet people that were interested in what I was working on and also be passionate about something that was just so freaking cool. So like I said, this is, this is the closure of this chapter. And the only reason I wanted to revisit this is because I was asked by community members of Coaster Printing Central. It's a Discord group, Instagram group that you can join, you can follow. And they asked me to give a behind the scenes look at what it was like to, I guess, pave the way of 3D printing coasters. So there's now a lot of people out there that are doing it. And I think if you're interested, you should do it. There's a lot of helpful information out there now. Um, and why you should get involved is because if you have a passion for roller coaster design or amusement park ride design, just get involved and just struggle your way through it and promote yourself. Show others what you're working on. It is how I at least grew my tiny little platform here and elsewhere. And if you show people what you can do, then they'll be more prone to contact you and, you know, see see where that relationship goes. So Coaster Printing Central is a Discord. It is a community. Um, they asked me to do a collaborative post. They wanted me to talk about it. where to go. This is the video. I hope you enjoy it. I will put all the links to join, to follow. Everything will be down in the description. Be sure to check it out. I want to give a personal shout out to Elijah who forced me and twisted my hand to make this video. I, I don't really like talking about all the stuff that I do because I don't know if there's interest, but he really wanted me to do it. So special thanks to him. He's been really, you know, pushing me to do some of the stuff. I hope you guys have really enjoyed it. So I just wanted to give that special plug. And also, I guess since we're giving plugs anyways, um, contribute to coaster merch. You know, there's these coaster cutouts. They're everywhere. Um, I designed them. I kind of grew this and found a way to continue my energy into the amusement industry. So yeah, check those things out. Let me know if you want to see some other cool ones. We are always working with parks to get those out there. Um, yeah, I think that's enough for the plug. So anyways, this is the behind the scenes look at Vertigo. Thanks. Subscribe.